Good afternoon. Welcome to Canyons U Bite Size PD. Today we are going to be talking about progress monitoring using Acadians. My name is Laura Tuesday Heathfield. I'm from the Instructional Supports Department. And if and when you join in, um, feel free to um, share your most burning question about progress monitoring. Just in case you haven't seen these before, these are our professional development norms. Um, be committed, be responsible, be respectful, and be safe. And um, I don't think anyone is live right now, but if you are, please mute your microphone and you can turn on your camera if you feel comfortable or blur your background if you'd like. And if you have a question or comment, you can either type it in the chat or activate your microphone. I'm happy to answer any questions that come up. So we are going to be talking about uh, progress monitoring, which is connected to um, Canyon's multi-tiered system of supports framework, specifically um, data for decision-making and student performance data, and even more specifically, uh, monitoring student academic growth. Our learning intention for today is, today I am learning about progress monitoring in the Acadians platform in order to track student progress over time. And I will know I'm successful when I am able to navigate the Acadians platform and utilize its features to enter student data, view student progress, and record adjustments to interventions. So these are the topics we're going to cover today. Um, I'm gonna to move my screen just so that my little bubble so that you can see the text. Um, what is progress monitoring? Why progress monitor? Who is progress monitored? And what skill is progress monitored just as a review so that we all have the same background knowledge? And then we'll go into specifics of progress monitoring in Acadians. I'll provide you with some non-examples of progress monitoring in Acadians and then overview of the gold standard um, in terms of um, how to document problem progress monitoring in Acadians. So let's start with what is progress monitoring. So based on a student's current level of performance, we establish goals to determine what learning will be occurring over time. And typically it's for the, the school year. Um, we monitor student progress by measuring their performance on a regular basis. Um, typically, it's weekly or every other week, depending on um, the student's performance, in order to be able to evaluate their growth toward their end of year goal. And their level of progress is determined by comparing their actual rate of learning to the expected rate of learning so that we can make adjust adjustments to instruction. It is a powerful strategy. Progress monitoring has been demonstrated to have a high effect size on student achievement, especially when those data are graphed and shared with students so they have a visual of their uh, progress over time. Why progress monitor? So students who are significant, significantly behind in basic skills, such as reading and math, need to have um, intensified instruction accompanied by that frequent monitoring so that we can evaluate how they're growing toward their goal. And students are likely to respond to those evidence-based instructions differently based on their skills. So it's not an exact science. So even if a, a student has a similar level of skill as another student, they may um, advance at a different rate than their comparison student. So, and we also don't know that this specific intervention will work with this specific student. So some of it's trial and error, and that's why we need to be monitoring their progress over time so that we can make adjustments and find something that might be better um, for them in terms of making progress. So progress monitoring allows us to make decisions based on their pattern of performance rather than those isolated pieces of information such as benchmark performance. Those are only occurring three times a year. And so if a student is behind, that doesn't give us a lot of information to adjust um, instruction around. Um, a lack of adequate progress should prompt that problem solving and um, intensification of interventions that we're using. And there, the, we can improve student outcomes when that performance is assessed regularly. Like I said, if, we don't, if we're only monitoring um, every once in a while, it's going to, um, we're gonna miss the opportunity to make those adjustments to improve their performance. 
who is progress monitored? So Utah law, Senate Bill 127, clearly specifies um, that any student who performs below or well below benchmark on curriculum-based measures, including a cadence reading and a cadence math, must be progress monitored. Obviously, the State Office of Education, State Board of Education, realizes the power of curriculum-based measures. And they also realized that um, schools are not using it as much as they should be to impact student performance. So the frequency that's required by Utah law um, is based on the student's benchmark performance. If a student performs well below benchmark, they should be monitored every one to two weeks, and they should be getting both core and intensive support. If a student scores below benchmark, they should be progress monitored every two to four weeks, and they should be receiving both core and strategic support. And if a student is at or above benchmark, they do not need to be progress monitored, um, only as necessary. And that would be occasionally you have a student who might be right on the edge of the benchmark and you might wanna monitor that student um, periodically to make sure that they're not falling behind because you don't wanna to wait to that next benchmark if um, their, their performance is dropping. Or there may be other um, information that you have about your student in the classroom that makes you think that perhaps they are not getting the skill that you are teaching. And so um, you might wanna um, do a progress monitoring probe. However, it should not be as frequent as we are um, assessing a, a student who is well below or below benchmark. And then progress monitoring is no longer necessary for those students who are, who are below or well below if they are consistently performing above benchmarks. And once they reach that level of performance, we no longer need to progress monitor at that frequency. Um, what skill is progress monitored? <clears throat> we refer to the hierarchy of skills to determine what skill that is. And so we're gonna target the lowest um, skill level depending on their performance. So for example, in reading, if a student is performing at benchmark on um, phonemic skills, it may be that we're targeting oral reading uh, skills for um, to progress monitor because that's the skill that they're deficient in. However, if a student is deficient in all of those skills, you would start with first sound fluency because that's the lowest skill level. And that would be the target of your progress monitoring. Um, similar with math, there's that hierarchy and we would go with where the student is struggling um, at the top of that list and moving down. So benchmark proficiency and growth. There are four benchmark levels in Acadience. And basically the benchmarks determine the odds of the student achieving later reading outcomes. So the odds op obviously are better if the student is at or above benchmark than they are if they're below or well below benchmark. Pathways of progress, on the other hand, provide a normative framework of comparison to help us set goals for individual students. And I'll talk a little bit later about ambitious, meaningful, and attainable goals, but it helps us to evaluate student progress in comparison with other students who are performing at the same level. So a student who performs um, with a certain score at the fall benchmark, that's who that student is compared to um, in terms of the pathways of progress. The pathways of progress are designed to be used in addition to, not in place of benchmark goals. So there's really two targets that we're um, looking at for student growth and student performance. And that is their benchmark proficiency and their pathways of progress. So the pathways help clarify what rate of progress is typical um, for a student who's performing at that level at the fall benchmark. So it's a dual lens. Like I said, we wanna uh, make sure we're focusing both on benchmark status and pathways of progress. So we don't wanna ignore one and focus on the other. We want to make sure that we have a handle on both of those, particularly for students who are um, struggling in attaining the academic skill. So in Pathways of Progress, there are five levels um, ranging from well below typical to well above typical. 
and um, these will appear in their uh, Acadians platform based on their progress over time so that you can see what level of progress that they're making in comparison with other students who have the same skill level as them. So I briefly mentioned the ambitious attainab attainable and meaningful goals. These are all guiding principles of how to set a goal in Pathways of Progress. So we want them to be ambitious because we want to move students who are um, below typical growth and uh, move them toward a goal by the end of the year. We also want them to be attainable. We don't want to make a goal so high that they're not realistic for that student because that can uh, result in frustration both on the student and teacher's part. And we want it to be meaningful. We want the outcomes to um, have a meaningful impact on that student in terms of their learning. So general guidelines for using pathways, uh, meaningful goals increase the odds of achieving important outcomes. So typical, below typical, and well below typical progress are really not very ambitious for students who are likely to need support. So that's usually not a goal that we're gonna choose for a student who's below benchmark, for example. Above typical progress is usually both attainable and ambitious for students who are likely to need support. However, that well above typical progress may or may not be attainable for students who need that support. So some individual professional judgment comes into play here. This would be um, great, um, perhaps, focus of a PLC with your team if you're struggling to know where um, to set a particular student's goal. Some questions to consider when you're setting goals for students. What rate is above typical progress compared to other students with similar initial skills? What rate of progress would be necessary to be able to narrow that gap um, with students who are making adequate progress? What rate of progress is needed to achieve important benchmark goals? So again, we're looking at that rate of growth and the benchmark, that dual um, focus. And then what rate of progress is necessary to reduce risk? Again, that's that benchmark prediction and increase the odds of achieving subsequent goals. So the next section, I'm going to talk specifically about using the Acadians data management platform. Um, you would be logging into acadianslearning.net using your teacher login or coach login and um, I'm going to first talk about how to set goals in Acadians. So in your homepage, once you've logged in, um, you're going to select data entry and pathways of progress goal setting. And this will give you a pop-up uh, window that likely just has your school and your grade in your class. However, if you're a coach, you would might have multiple grades and multiple classes to select from. And once you target that, um, you submit that and that um, group of students will pop up. Um, handily, it, when you start, um, when that pop-up opens, it also gives you, the Cadence platform gives you this section on guiding you through setting pathways. So it's basically a summary of what I'm going to go through right now, but it's always there, which is great. There's also a link to a Pathways of Progress goal setting handout that might be helpful um, if you need additional guidance on how to select a goal for a particular student. At the bottom of that um, section, you can select whether to show all your students or only show students who are below benchmark or only show students who are well below benchmark on the composite. And my suggestion would be to start with um, looking at either below or well below so that you're looking at those students first and setting some um, goals for them, and then you can go back to show all students and set goals for your students who are at or above benchmark. They should have goals too, but they don't necessarily need to be progress monitored. So once you're um, at that point, you're going to see your list of students, and they'll have them listed by name, and it'll have all the skills that they were assessed on. I believe this is an example of a grade one student. And as you can see, um, their correct letter sounds in nonsense word fluency is below benchmark. That's why it's a clear little box next to it. 
Um, and so this will be the target skill for this student in terms of progress monitoring and goal setting, because we want this school, this skill, sorry, this skill, which is at that lower end of that hierarchy is needed before we can work on the next skills of, for example, whole words read. So I'm identifying that as my target for my goal. Um, I'm gonna set my goal by clicking in the box to the far right to establish an end of year goal. And once I click on that box to set the goal, it, the um, program is going to pop up with what would what might be a good goal for each of those pathways of progress. And remember, we said we wanted to um, focus on above typical or well above typical to um, be sure to close that achievement gap. So I'm looking at this and it gives a suggestion of 65 if I'm focusing on a well above typical and a goal of 57 if I'm looking at above typical. But recall that we want that dual focus on both pathways and benchmark. So I also know that my grade one end of year benchmark for correct letter sounds is 58. So I definitely wanna make it at least 58 because I want this student to reach the benchmark by the end of the year. And if I look at that um, above typical range, they're suggesting a 57, which is just below that benchmark range. So I'm probably, and they're also giving you a range of what would be above typical growth. And so anywhere in there could be a target for your end of year goal that you could enter in the box. And I would probably select 58 or around 58, 58 or 60 or something like that to um, enter into the uh, platform. So that's basically the process is to consider what pops up in terms of that above typical to close the gap. I could select well above typical, but that's a pretty huge jump for this particular student because they're at 12 right now and to get to 65 or above by the end of the year might be a challenge. So right now I might set my goal more toward the above typical pathway and maybe make an adjustment at the, at the mid-year benchmark depending on their performance. And then this is the process for, so once I enter my goal, now I have my goal displayed in um, a cadence and I can enter progress monitoring data to um, track their progress with that goal. And so back on that homepage, we're back to data entry, but now we're going to select enter progress monitoring. And again, you're gonna get the pop-up um, uh, window with choices of class and which students to show. Um, you can show all students or just students with scores. It doesn't, um, most of your students are gonna have scores anyway. So once you're in there, you'll, you'll have all the different skills um, that are assessed by that measure. And I'm focusing right now on reading. Um, at the top is the toggles for um, the months of the year. So we're currently in May and we're currently in the first week of May, I think. Perhaps we're in the second one. No, we're in the first week of May. And I now, I'm looking at nonsense word fluency, which is my goal for three of my students, student three, student four, and student seven. So I've done my progress monitoring on nonsense word fluency for um, first week of May on those three students because that's their goal, goal um, in terms of progress monitoring. So I'm gonna enter those scores there. And you can see, for the nonsense word fluency, you do get two scores. You get um, correct letter sounds and whole, whole words read. It's the one subtest, but you do get two scores. So it's kind of a bonus, even though we're uh, monitoring correct letter sounds for our target and goal, we also have the um, uh, additional information of whole words read, but correct letter sounds is our target. So using those data as we collected over time, um, we use that data then to guide our interventions. So we've identified our instructional target based on our data. So it's correct letter sounds for that particular student. And then we wanna match the instruction to the intervention or intervention to the assessment results. So I wouldn't be assessing on um, um, word fluency or reading fluency, if my target is correct letter sounds, I would be assessing on what I'm intervening on. 
I'm giving that student additional um, phonemic awareness and phonics instruction so that they can improve that score. That's what I'm going to assess on as well. So if we're noticing that the student is not responding to that intervention that I've um, planned, the first thing to ask is, was the intervention implemented with fidelity? And this is one question that we forget to ask a lot. We just say it didn't work or it worked. But what is it about the intervention that in implementation uh, data that we have um, that suggests that it is working or is not working? So how do you know? Are you collecting data on how the intervention is implemented, the frequency, who's, inter who's intervening, how the student is doing during that intervention uh, session? And then does the intensity of the intervention match the student's needs? So we want to look at the duration or frequency of the intervention, the group size, maybe the student performs better in a one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one, um, size as opposed to a group of three or four. Uh, level of motivation, can we improve um, um, motivators that we provide during that intervention to make it um, more successful? And then another variable to look at is the attendance of the student and or the interventionist. So um, if one or the other is absent frequently, that could be impacting um, the intensity of the intervention. I mean, we might wanna make some adjustments based on that. So here are some progress monitoring decision rules. Um, the first one is the one we wanna see and that is the student's performance exceeds the aim line. So whatever that goal was, they're doing great. They're um, making great progress. And so uh, then we would maybe want to go back and increase our goal or discontinue or fade the intervention or both. Um, obviously, we would continue universal instruction for that student, but we might want to um, adjust the goal if they're making good progress or begin to fade the intervention. If the student's performance is in line with the aim line or the goal that we've set, we would continue with that intervention because it's being effective and we're making progress. However, if the student performance falls below that aim line, we don't wanna lower the goal, we wanna intensify the intervention. So looking at those variables of frequency, duration, group size, motivation, et cetera. And then make those adjustments in the intervention to again, assess whether we can make that um, improvement happen. So in um, Acadians, we can also document when we make those changes in interventions um, by um, creating change lines in the graphs. So in that section where you're entering progress monitoring data, there are two, let's see if my cursor works here, there are two like really light gray boxes next to, this is where you would enter scores. And if you click on that, um, it will allow you to add an instructional support change line is the, the language that they use. It's essentially a phase change line. We're changing something about the intervention. A pop-up window allows you to provide detailed information regarding what change you're making. And I would suggest being as detailed as possible so that when you're looking at the graph, you don't, your team doesn't have to remember what did we change um, back in March that made it more effective um, you have specific data right on the chart that tells you um, exactly what change you made. Um, so what warrants documentation as an instructional change in the progress monitoring platform? I would say any of these things, a different focus on instruction, additional component that you add like self-monitoring, the frequency of reinforcers you're providing for the student, increased OTRs, group size, an added scaffold, any of those things that would be important to um, document in um, the platform so that it appears in the graph. And so when you're interpreting your data, you have specific information about what those um, changes were. And basically that's what I would say is any detail that helps uh, understanding why a student may a student may or may not be re making progress in um, that particular skill. So I'm going to go through some non-examples of progress monitoring that, um, unfortunately, these are actual examples that are in our Acadians uh, platform, but these are not things that we want to see. One is that we're progress monitoring the entire class. This is a waste of um, instructional resources, which are 
um, too few and far between in your classrooms, as you know. Um, so don't spend time uh, progress monitoring everybody. It should be, we should be progress monitoring students that are um, below or well below uh, benchmark and only in the skill that they're uh, targeted for that intervention. This is another non-example. This is um, three students are being progress monitored rather, rather frequently. However, they're being progress monitored on everything. And obviously not everything is their goal. Um, we do wanna see improvement in skills across um, different skill areas, but we wanna target whatever skill area is their lowest efficiency level. So if we're targeting correct letter sounds, for example, we don't need to be monitoring um, oral reading fluency. Um, obviously, we'll still have that score for whole words read, so we can include that, but we don't need to give them another probe um, to assess a different skill. Focus on the skill that you're intervening on. Another um, non-example of progress monitoring, here is a student who is well below benchmark. Um, so we have the fall benchmark and the winter benchmark, and yet we have no progress monitoring happening despite being well below benchmark. This um, is not good practice, and also currently it's um, not following Utah state law. So this student should be, be, be monitored um, every week or every other week because they are well below benchmark. So we should have data on every one of those hashtags in between the fall and winter benchmark. Similarly, this student has no progress monitoring either. Um, and you could argue in the fall, they were kind of just below benchmark and maybe they didn't need it, but certainly by the winter benchmark where they fell well below benchmark, they should be have begun progress monitoring on a, a weekly or every other week basis. Another non-example, um, in this example, the student is above benchmark um, and almost well above benchmark by that blue line, and yet they're being progress monitored. Again, this is an example of um, teaching resources that could be used better in another way. Another non-example is there's no pathway. So we don't know if the student is making typical progress, above typical progress, below typical progress based on their fall benchmark score. We have a goal, but we don't know what level of progress that they're making um, in comparison with other students. And then this is a non-example. This has um, the pathways identified, but no goal. So we don't really know what we're aiming for. And um, more importantly, the student doesn't know what they're aiming for. What is my goal and how am I progressing toward that goal if I don't know what my goal is? So make sure you identify a goal for your students. And then this non-example, um, obviously the student is being progress monitoring. They are below and well below benchmark. Um, obviously it's not working whatever intervention we're doing, and maybe there were changes that were made, but there's no documentation that um, any changes were made or any adjustments in the intervention. So make sure you include changes in your interventions in um, the platform. So this is a gold standard of what your progress monitoring reports should look like. So there is an end of your goal. There is a focus on one target skill, monitored at the required frequency. You can see this is weekly and the student was well below benchmark. Um, the pathways are there so that colored lines represent the different pathways. The student um, was having some struggles, but it looks like there have been two changes um, in the intervention. So the intervention change lines are there. Um, the descriptions are below. My cursor works here. So number one was, we, which is this one, we changed the focus of instruction. I would probably give more detail than that, than just change the focus, like what was it changed to? And then number two, change in group size. Again, I would be more specific of what the change was. We increased it from two to four, or we decreased it from five to two, whatever it might be. So that would be what we're aiming for in the platform, um, to have all the elements, um, documented in the platform. So it's very easy to pull up and anyone on the team could um, um, interpret it in the same way. 
So let's revisit our learning intention and success criteria. Hopefully you have been learning about progress monitoring in the platform in order to track student progress. And you will be successful as you navigate the platform and utilize the features to enter student data, view student progress, make those adjustments to interventions as they're needed and record the adjustments to interventions. Um, something to think about as you exit today, what adjustments are you planning to make to your progress monitoring practices? And I would also encourage you to consider how might your PLC use student performance data differently for instructional decisions. So how could your PLC use student progress monitoring data to inform um, your instruction across um, the PLC members? Thank you for joining us today. Um, these are some important links for you to be able to get back to Canyons U or the Bite Size PD page, as well as information about relicensure. Um, you can also contact me if you have any questions about progress monitoring. I'd be happy to chat with you more. Uh, thanks for joining us, and hopefully we'll see you next time. <laughs>